take full form and you become a worshiper of God. Amen. Where worship has now become your normal. Where it's normal for you to say hallelujah. That's right. I've been talking about some of this in our churches in Saskatchewan. and there, There's a, a, a sweet lady there that uh, she, she's, you know, she, she's really loves the Lord, but she's a little bit conservative. And, and I've been talking about some of this. She told me the other day she's something about she was with some lady who didn't know the Lord or something like that. And, and uh, she was looking for something. All of a sudden she found it. She goes, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> And it was, at one time, very abnormal for her. <laughs> but she's been practicing. <laughs> Amen. That's why some of you can swear at the drop of a dime. You've got a lot of practice. <laughs> but we need to practice our hallelujah. Amen. And it's in those times where it's hard to get it out. you got to shout it even if it feels like you've got to force it. Amen. You can say hallelujah, and that's all well and good. But there are some times you've got to shout it. Yes. Yes. There are some times you've got to shout it. There is significance in a shout. Yes. Yes. I'm talking about the kind of shout that, that shakes you on the inside, that yeah. shakes up everything in your heart, and all that craziness in your head, you can't even hear it anymore because there's a hallelujah yeah. vibrating off the walls of your heart. That kind of shout. Hallelujah! Thank you, Lord. <laughs> that causes every devil in a 10 mile radius to begin to. Shiver a little bit because that hallelujah is coming out with power. And in those times, you got to force it out. that it begins to become so much more significant in your life. The Bible says, shout for joy in the Lord. This is the same scripture that I quoted this morning where it talks about praise is coming for the upright. In the King James, it says, Rejoice in the Lord, Psalm 33 and 1. But in the ESV, it says, Shout for joy in the Lord. Shout for joy in the Lord. There ought to be joy in the house of God. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I just know today that we, we, we can have church beyond what we've had church. I'm talking about where you, you almost forget how to speak English because all you can do is talk in tongues. Where you can't get up off the floor anymore because the weight of the glory has just pinned you down. The janitor's pulling you out by your ankles because he wants to go home. book of Acts, they, they were so intoxicated in the Holy Ghost that worldly people couldn't even tell the difference if they were drunk on alcohol or what was going on. Right. That's church. Yeah. That's church. Don't tell me that they can have it. We can't. Right. I know there's a lot of people who want to preach that nonsense. What a sad, sorry message. Right. They got it, but we can't. Yeah. That's not my God. That's right. Amen. Amen. They got it. I can Amen. Jesus even said himself, greater works than these shall ye do. And so as I marvel at everything that Jesus did, he said, you know, this isn't the end of the story, boys. Come on. This right. isn't where it is. Right. There's still much more for this. Yeah. So we know not to look back at, at, at the first outpouring and think that's the pinnacle. That's the beginning. That's not the end. That was the start of the fire. The disciples were carriers of the fire. Taking that throughout the countries and throughout the regions. Amen. Where people that had no idea about God would one day experience God. And I just want you to know today, this Holy Ghost is real. And this Holy Ghost is for you. I don't care if you're Lutheran. I don't care if you're Methodist. I don't care if you're Baptist. I don't care if you're a witch. We're going to get that devil out of you tonight if you want to get saved. And then I'm going to tell you, the Holy Ghost is for you. Yeah. 
There needs to be a heart in us that is in pursuit of God's presence. I never talked about very much this morning what was actually the second part of the title of my message, where it's praising with intention and understanding. But understanding is also something that becomes very significant in our praise and in our worship. For example, we understand that it's because of the blood of Jesus that I can come into the presence of the Lord. It's not because I had a good day. It's not because my performance was excellent. And you showed up at Sunday morning thinking I didn't make any mistakes at all today. You probably made ten that you didn't even know about. But now you feel like you can end. It's nothing to do with that. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, you know, there's a lot of stuff that the devil will try and get in your way. But the reason that we can come into the presence of God is because the blood of Jesus has made a way for us to get in. Yeah. And he has torn the veil from top to bottom so that we can come into the place where the presence of God is. It's because of the blood of Jesus. We praise with understanding where we know that he is merciful. We, we, we praise with understanding where we know that he is God, where he is creator, where he is magnificent. I mean, praise takes us to a place in praise uh, where we, where we uh, are, are elevated because we have now understanding. I now understand. You see, you could sit there and think, I'm guilty. I can't praise the Lord. But understanding, and I'm talking about true understanding in your heart, not just getting it in your head, where you can know, yeah, I missed it, but that much more I need to get in His presence. Right. That much more I need to get in His presence. Too many times you let things keep you away from the house of God. No, that's much more reason to get to the house of God. That's much more reason to get in His presence. That much more you need your breakthrough. And so we need to have a heart that is in pursuit of His presence. Because in the presence of the Lord, the Bible says, there is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. In His presence, there is peace. Because he is the prince of peace. The author of peace. It's who he is. And so when you get in the presence, you are literally in the presence of peace. I found in my own life there are some things that just don't heal until you get in his presence. Some emotions I just can't get rid of until I get in his presence. Some things that go on in the mind. That just don't seem to subside until I get in his presence. Because there are many mysteries in the presence of God. And some of them are hard to explain. But there's things that I, I, I find very interesting. For example, I left my seat this morning, came up to the altar, and felt the presence of God that much heavier when I got up here. And it's kind of funny that. The presence of God can fill different radiuses of a building in greater measure. That's kind of funny, isn't it? And so you might sit in your seat and the pastor says, you need to be at this altar right now. And your carnal mind says, no, I just need to sit right here because God's the same at the back of the church as he is at the front. <laughs>
Because human nature is to be comfortable. But, but sometimes God will challenge us to be uncomfortable and do what we're not used to doing. Where he might say, run, jump, shout, pray for this person. Go up there, get prayer, do something. And all of a sudden, you know, God just breaks through in your life. God still asks me to do things I'm uncomfortable with. Right. <laughs> I, was, I was at a, a preacher's rally a couple years ago, a minister's conference. For the very first time, I'd ever been there. I, I maybe knew one or two people in that place. They were all new to me. But I, I had an invitation to go, and I went. Some very awesome ministers, you know, like older men that just... Just full of knowledge of the word, experienced men of God. And at the altar service, God speaks to me and says, go get some Kleenex and get down before him and clean his shoes. <laughs> I don't know these people. They're going to think I'm some nut job. Maybe some, of them did. Maybe some of them did on some flake. I went here off the street now. You know, but, but I'm sitting there and I'm fighting with it. I'm fighting with it. I even turned to my wife. I'm like, oh, it's just in my heart to go up there and wipe his feet. I don't know if it's just me or not. My wife said, I don't think that's just you. <laughs> that's not something I think about doing all the time. I didn't come in here and know that, you know, I don't know what Paul's got on, but... <laughs> somebody's feet up real good tonight. I'm not shoeshine Jimmy or whatever you want to call it. But I had to do something. Amen. And I did it. And, and uh, you know, the only thing the man of God said to me was that God had just given him that scripture right before church or something like that. I had no idea why I had to do it. I had no idea what it meant to him. I have no idea still what anybody else thought about it. It doesn't matter. God told me to do it. Sometimes when we respond to the Lord, we're still left with a few questions, and that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> we're left with a few questions. Yeah. Even when you've done what you're supposed to do. I rolled into town one time as I was evangelizing. I went to a community I had uh, only been in one time prior. I ministered in there for two nights in a hall. This group of people brought me in to speak. I had a couple good meetings there. But now I'm with somebody else. He takes me to a house of a man I've never met. He never met me. Never seen me in his life. He was some sort of preacher at one time or something. And we go in, sit down with lunch. He introduces me. And the first words out of his mouth were, heard of him. What I heard is not good. Something like that. What, what, a, what a lovely introduction. Yeah. Well, let's have tea. Break out the cookies, man. Let's have some beautiful fellowship here. <laughs> but that's how it went. And so we sat there in awkward, random conversations for about an hour. I didn't bring it up again. I knew that there was a lot of division in that community. And when I had went there, God told me to speak about submission. So I, I, I had a good idea what it was about. Had nothing to do with me, but the word, whatever, whatever I preached that hit some chord in that 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 community, somebody went there yapping about something. <laughs> and so we're about to leave, and he says, "Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it was all about." He says, and "I said no, don't. I, I don't need to know." And I told him about a story that I had heard one time. That I still remember, and it obviously had affected me because I was now implementing it. And it was when a bunch of preachers came to a man of God that had been ministering, and they began to tell him certain things that this preacher had been saying to him about it. He started to cry. And they said, Oh, that, that really hurt you what he did, eh? He said, I'm not crying about that. I'm crying because you made me think evil of my brother. Right. And he would have rather that they never told him right. what everybody had been saying. Right. When I said that, the anointing of God fell. Just bam. 
it, it, whatever, whatever was there was broken. It was over. I, I mean, I felt the anointing so strong. I